Well, good morning, Bay Chapel. What a powerful time in worship together. My goodness. Wow. What an amazing time. Hey, if this is your first time or your first time in a long time, I just want to personally say on behalf of our lead pastors, Pastor Wes and Jen, thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you were in the room or you're watching online, we couldn't be more grateful that you chose to spend your Sunday morning with Bay Chapel family. Hey, actually, for those who are in the room, would you help me say good morning to those who are watching online? Just real quick, would you just give it up for them? Wherever you are, we understand that this is a season where everybody's kind of in and out, so we are so grateful to have technology where our church family can still engage and still be connected and still be a part. Well, if you haven't heard or it's been a while since you've been here, um, we have the privilege of being in a season where Pastor Wes and Jen are getting a chance to get away on a sabbatical, everybody. And I had a chance to speak with him earlier this week, and I tell you, they were enjoying themselves in the mountains of Colorado, just really recharging and resting. So if you would, just continue to pray for them as they uh, just continue to fill up. We are believing God for fresh vision as we head quickly into year 10 as a church. So please cover them, pray for them. Um, and then this morning, I'm going to move really quickly because we have the privilege of hearing from someone who is near and dear to this house and this family. Anybody know Mama C, everybody? Miss Christy. And as you can already tell, if she does not come quietly, it's going to be big, whatever it is. So I'm hanging on the edge of my seat, ready to hear this word. So would you all help me honor Mama C, Miss Christy, everybody. Would you all please rise for our bride? This music, does it stir emotion in your heart? When you hear this familiar tune and you rose to your feet, did you feel something stirring inside of you? Were you expect, have expectations? Oh. The music is a signal that something is about to happen. Something beautiful and meaningful and, and sweet something tender and romantic and pure um but i think you may be seated because it's not quite my expectations either this music usually symbolizes a beautiful ceremony between two people that love each other and we typically have an anticipation of the moment that the bride comes down the aisle. That beautiful moment of seeing her in her splendor make a grand entrance. But this is a harsh juxtaposition of an unprepared bride. Thank you, Kristen. I, I hope that that, as entertaining as it was, was still a harsh tension in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind. I hope it kind of clashed with the beauty of what we expect at a typical wedding. Brides spend so much time and energy, believe me, I've seen it, and planning for that walking down the aisle moment. It's such a beautiful moment. And typically, brides are gorgeous, and they look forward to that moment, that um, gasp of the guests and the reaction of the groom is so all-important to every sweet and 
beautiful bride. I've been to 410 weddings in the last few years. And each one is so emotional, whether it's a backyard, a beach, or a ballroom, they all carry so much emotion. And I've studied weddings for a while now. And I, I believe that there is more to what we feel than just romance at a wedding. I think what we feel is based on what the Bible teaches us about our relationship with God. Did you know that he often uses a type, an example, an illustration by calling us the bride of Christ? He uses the illustration of a bride and groom to illustrate his relationship with us. And there are so many references in his word about the betrothal and the marriage. And did you know from ancient to current Orthodox Jewish culture, a wedding has two halves. It has the betrothal ceremony, the Essene, Erushin, sorry, <laughs> I'm practicing my Hebrew, the Erushin, and then it also, the second half is the actual wedding, the Neshwin. So you may remember what we call our Christmas story, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. They had had their Erushin. And remember, he was thinking he was going to have to put her away quietly. It was a big deal. It was like a divorce. It had carried a lot more weight than our engagements do. And just like a wedding in our tradition as well has a ceremony and a celebration, the Erushin also had a ceremony and a celebration. And in Hosea 2, it says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge and accept in return the Lord. Now, if you think our illustration was a little jarring, you should read Hosea 2. God wrote that script, and let me tell you, it's rated R. <laughs> But the second part is the wedding, and that's going to happen when we get to heaven, the Neshwin. And in Revelation, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage, the Neshwin of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So what was an Eshwin celebration or ceremony like? I'm so glad you asked because it had a system, it had a pattern. And just like our marriage ceremonies, it was very recognizable and very traditional. So the first step, step one, together, the father and the son select a potential bride. So as we go through the Eshwin, I want you to remember who is each of these roles in what the Bible teaches us about our relationship with God. So the father is obviously the father, the son is Jesus, and we are the, the bride. So they go to the young woman's house, and they meet with her father, and the dads have a little chat, and they negotiate, and they barter, because it's more like a business deal than something romantic, and the match can be made for financial or even political reasons, not necessarily romantic. So next, they discussed and finally agreed on what was called the bride price. It is her estimated cumulative worth. Everything that if she left, would it would cost the family. What is it going to cost us to replace her, to shepherd all of our sheep? And then it was also her redemptive price. Redemption is to ransom or to free or rescue by paying a price, claiming or taking possession of something that already belongs to you. We are his creation. And when Jesus came, he rescued us. He redeemed us. It was also a payment for her debt. Anything, any price she had incurred to the family. What about that time she crashed the family camel? or the time that she broke the neighbor's uh, water pot 
everything that she had cost the family, all of her debt, you were bought with a price, the Bible says. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. So then honor and glorify God in your body. So the bride price is paid to the father. And then, listen to this. The moment the price is paid for her, her debt is canceled. And at that moment, her earthly father no longer has ownership over her. He no longer has authority over her. She is no longer under his control. She is free. For now, she technically belongs to the groom's household, to that father and his family. So even though she'll continue to live in his household, she is not of his household. We remain here, but we are not of here, right? So the price was paid, the bride is redeemed, and then the ceremony could begin. This is where it gets fun. And this was one of my favorite parts. It was called the wine ceremony. So the father of the groom and the groom come to the front of the space and they call everybody in the entire household, typically multiple wives, tons of children, all of the servants, everyone gathers to watch this beautiful ceremony. And the father of the young man pours a glass of wine. Wine has so much symbolism in the word of God. And the father of the groom hands it to his son. And this, the son drinks from the cup. And then he passes it to the young woman. And as he takes it and he hands it to her, he says these time-honored words. This is a new covenant in my blood. Now, where have you heard that before? How about last Sunday? This is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Yes, Jesus said at the, what we call Last Supper, which was the annual Passover meal, and, and at the Seder, at the Passover meal, everything on the table was symbolic. Have you ever been to a Seder before, Passover? Yes. Everything on the plate is symbolic, and especially the cups of wine. So imagine this scene at the Last Supper, at the Passover with Jesus. All of his men are present, all 12 of them. First, he shocks them by washing their feet, and that rocked their world. They recovered from that, and they have anticipated this evening, just like we would anticipate Thanksgiving or Christmas. They looked forward to it, and they knew every tradition, every ritual, everything that the, the bits of food meant, all the readings and the storytellings. It was all about their history and God's faithfulness through their history. And mid-festivities, Jesus shocks them again, and he says, one of you will betray me. And Judas leaves the building. He exits. But the traditions continue with the beautiful breaking of the unleavened bread and each thing meaning having such beautiful memories and, and traditions and remembrances of their history. And then as he is prone to do, Jesus rocks their world again and breaks with tradition. Using the very elements from the table, he brings his faithful 11 from celebrating Jewish history and tradition and the covenant that God had with Abraham and Moses. And now he transitions and he brings it to today and a new covenant in my blood. And he brings it into a new relationship, a new promise with the Messiah. As it says in 1 Corinthians, and he did the same with the cup after supper, after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And when he said those words, all of those 11 guys were familiar with that, just as you would be with dearly beloved. Or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? 
such familiar terminology from the betrothal ceremony. And so I can just, in my imagination, which is warped from now and then, um, I can see Peter going, did he just propose to us? <laughs> because that was the proposal words. And he's trying cracking up and John shushes him because John was very serious. But when he did that, they all recognized those words. So let's go back to our betrothal ceremony. So first the groom drinks from the cup saying, I'm all in, I'm committed to you. And that was a bit vulnerable for him because he commits first and then the young woman indicates her choice in the agreement that this is her first and only opportunity to have a say. And she can either refuse his offer, let this cup pass from me, or she can accept his offer and drink from the cup. And when she would drink, it meant, all right, I'm all in. I'm committed, I do. And so when the 11 drank from that cup, wow, they were saying, I accept you, Jesus. I'm in a new covenant relationship, I do, until death do us part. And all 11 drank from the cup on that day. So the bride price is paid. They have the covenant ceremony with the glass of wine. And then the next step in this engagement ceremony is the signing of the bridal contract or what was called the ketubah. And this is a modern day ketubah, which you can purchase on Etsy for a mere $425 plus shipping because it is still done in very orthodox traditional Jewish ceremonies. So the ketubah contained 10 vows. You shall have no other husbands or lovers before me. You shall remember the Sabbath. We will keep it holy together. We will honor each other's parents. Are these starting to sound familiar to you? Yes, because the whole picture of the children of Israel in the wilderness was also a picture of a covenant bride and groom relationship. It was powerful. So they would sign the ketubah. They would sign that they agreed. Back to that same night where Jesus shared the cup with the disciples, with his 11 faithful that same night, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep the ketubah. You will keep our bridal agreement. You will keep our vows. So next in the bridal ceremony, the bride gets to have a line. She gets to say something. She was typically about 14 or 15 years old, probably terrified in front of such a big crowd all watching her in this very nervous moment of being selected to be a bride, but she gets a line in the ceremony. She gets to ask a question. So she says, when will you return for me? And the groom in the time-honored tradition always said the same thing. I am going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And when I return, only my father knows. Oh. <laughs> Read John 14 with new eyes because that's part of the betrothal ceremony. Right after they had shared the cup, Jesus says to his guys, listen, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a chuppah for you, a temporary dwelling place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And then Matthew gives us a little bit more information and says, but of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but the father alone. Wow. That gives you new perspective on what Jesus was saying that night. All through John is the engagement ceremony. 
So after the question and the response and everything's going well, then it's time for a party. <laughs> we all love a good excuse for a party. So it's kind of like a bridal shower. Gifts are given by friends and family to this new bride and groom. And then the groom departs and the bride is left there to begin something called her tevila, her tevila, which meant her bridal preparations. So the first thing the bride does in her preparations is called a mikvah. I think you should try it. You're making me do all the Hebrew words up here. Mikvah. Thank you. Mikvah was a ritual cleansing or a baptism. After she accepted him, she was baptized. And mikvah literally means the name of the Lord is hope. And I know you all know what hope means. A confident and joyful expectation of what is to come. <laughs> Listen to me for a moment. Her mikvah was an outward sign. It was a symbolic ritual to say, I'm taken. I'm chosen. I choose him back and I have decided. And when she went under that water, an old name and comes up a new and alive, beautiful, radiant young bride, her old life dead and her new life all waiting before her, she had decided. She is now wearing his name. So next in her tevila, after her mikvah, she would wear a veil over her face for the remainder of her engagement. And this is so beautiful. And the Hebrew word for that veil and that ritual is hadash. Her hadash, which meant holy, which simply means set apart. So unlike an engagement ring that means I'm taken this was her engagement ring. Anyone that saw a young lady with a veil knew she's betrothed, she's set apart, she's taken. Then she would cleanse her gown and get that ready, the purest, finest white fabric. And please read Ephesians 5 when you get time. The whole chapter is about bridal preparation and comparing it to us as believers. But here in Revelation 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The bridal preparations. In the meantime, the groom goes back to his father's house. And the first thing they do, are you ready for your head to explode? The first thing they do is they send the most trusted, highest ranking servant back to the bride so that she is not alone. They select an ambassador, a representative of the father's house and the family to stay with her. Of whom is that symbolic? Yes, I'm so glad you're tracking with me. And Jesus, again, that same night told his guys, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I go away. Because unless I go away, the advocate, the ambassador, the representative will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So this advocate has a lot of responsibilities with the bride. First, he anoints her, which further symbolizes her being holy and set apart and royalty. Then he gives her gifts, jewelry, and all kinds of wonderful gifts. And guess what? The Holy Spirit gives all of this to you, too. He teaches her the ways of her new family and the protocol of her new home. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, it says in John 14, the ambassador whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. And I love this part. One of the things he gives her is a ring. 
Now, not just any kind of ring, but a signet ring. And these were found in an archaeological dig of ancient traditional signet rings. And it was worn on your index finger of your right hand. And it was big and chunky <laughs> because it had to make an impression in wax quite often. And the ring that they would give the bride was symbolic of so many things. And it's the very things that the Holy Spirit gives to us. It was identity. It had the family crest on it. It showed the name of the Father and his kingdom, his crest, his signature, his mark. It was a ring of provision because it acted as a credit card. She could take that to the market and said, I'll take all of this, and here is my signature. And she would place that on there, and the father's house was good for it. And it was a symbol of authority so that this little 15-year-old, when she directed the servants, could say, okay, I'm going to need this moved over here. And I'm going to need new curtains over there. And I don't know that this is true, but I kind of believe that that's why we use that finger today to boss people around. <laughs> because when you want to get up in your kid's face, what do you do? What did I tell you? <laughs> and listen just for a second. You carry the authority of the kingdom of heaven on your little finger. Not today, Satan. <laughs> you put that back. Take your hands off of my family. This is God's property. Sickness, you have to go. Depression, anxiety, get out of here. I evict you in Jesus' name because I carry the name of the groom. Who? somebody needs to say amen. amen. <laughs> the ambassador stayed with her. He was with her always, backing her up. If she went to the marketplace and they looked at her funny, he was right back there. And you have that with you today. Everywhere you go, you can walk with your head held high with that authority and the backing of the kingdom of heaven. When she felt exhausted or frustrated or tired or hopeless, he was that present, constant reminder of hope. Your groom's coming back for you. And he had a joyful expectation alongside of her. Because in the very last book of our Bible, Revelation, it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, the ambassador and the bride are a team. They're together, joyfully hopeful for his return. He's coming back. I promise he's coming back. In the meantime, I'm here. We got this. You're not alone. I'm just as excited about his return as you are. All right. So meanwhile, the father and the son, the groom begins to work on something called the chupa. And it was a temporary dwelling. It's used symbolically in wedding ceremonies to this day in a Jewish culture. Um, they are symbolic of a couple's home. And in the proper tradition, the groom is supposed to build it with his own hands. So our groom starts to build this home for us. And I have a trick question for you. Are we going to live in heaven for eternity? A chuppah is a temporary dwelling. That's why it looks like a little tent and it's open. We're not going to live in heaven forever. That's our temporary home. Oh, you got to look up in Revelation, New Jerusalem. Google that, but not right now. And then the groom's other way to occupy himself is he waits for the Father's word. He's waiting for the Neshwin. And are you ready for this? Neshwin means literally to carry away to the wedding feast. Because if you read Song of Solomon, the weddings in that day 
were like a surprise party. Can you imagine, ladies? You would have to keep your manicure done at all times. You never knew when your wedding was going to be. If you read Song of Solomon, it is beautiful. And then one day the father gives the word. He says, today's the day. And the groom would dress in his finery. And the entire household would join him. And they would start a parade. A parade to the bride's home, to the Neshwin, to carry away his bride. There would be a sound of a trumpet, a shofar announcing his coming. And let me tell you about the shofar. It was a very loud trumpet sound. It was made of a ram's horn. And it was a way to communicate with the entire community because they couldn't text each other. So they would blow the shofar and the different ways to blow it, the different sounds had different messages. One would be a call to a meeting. One would be a call to battle. But there was one that was a long blast and it was the call to worship. And it was powerful. It could make walls fall and tremble. It was a call to worship. And this was the one they used on wedding days. And when the people heard that sound, and they heard the best man, someone would fall out in front of this parade of the groom and the father and the family, and he would announce, he would shout, the groom is coming. <laughs> Here comes the groom. Everyone make way, prepare for the groom. And then that sound of the trumpet, and everyone would fall in line. Can you imagine? arriving at the bride's home, how her family would feel when she is ready. Can you imagine the shame if she's not? So every day, our love struck groom asked his father. He goes into the throne room and he says, Dad, is today the day? Do we get to go get her today? How about now? <laughs> Can we go get her today? And one of these days, one of these days, it's going to be different when he goes in there. He's going to walk in and he's going to say, Dad, is today the day? His father is going to say, today's the day. Son, let's go get your bride. So would you please rise in celebration? Because our groom is coming back for us one day with the sound of the shofar and the shout of here comes the groom. For the Lord himself will come down with a shout of command and the voice of the archangel and blast that again. Let's hear that shofar nice and loud. It's going to rattle your windows when it happens one day. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up simultaneously together. The resurrected ones. And we will meet the Lord in the clouds. Do it again. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so we will all live happily ever after. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending the groom to us. Thank you for coming down to earth. And as you bow your heads, I want you to just imagine him before you our proposals, our tradition, and our culture is for a young man to, to take a knee and offer a young lady a ring. And that's a very vulnerable physical position to take a knee before someone. Will you accept this rose? <laughs> and I want you to imagine Jesus standing before you today. And he's all in. He is all in. He's committed to loving you forever. 
And you get to decide. You get to refuse the cup. Let this pass from me. Or you get to drink from the cup and say, I accept you. I choose you back. I choose you as my groom. And I wait for you. So in your heart right now, maybe you've prayed this prayer a hundred times. I've prayed it since I was a little girl, but it never hurts to just say it again. Jesus, I accept you. I accept your proposal. Wash me in the mikvah of your blood. Make me pure and clean and worthy. I don't want to be an unprepared bride. I want to be ready for you. I want to see that look in your eye when I walk down the aisle. The one that says, well done. The one that's full of joy. And you just being proud of us. So I accept you and I wait for you. Hurry. We can't wait to see you and be with you forever in your kingdom. We love you so much, Jesus. And we wait for your return with your Holy Spirit, empowering us, encouraging us, and reminding us of the hope that is to come.